How about that team win? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, the journey continues, and we're just getting started. Woo. What you did tonight was you earned that second season. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you earned, okay? And what I saw tonight was, guys, you know what I saw? It was, I got your back. It was, I got your back. And what this team has showed time and time again is that I will fight my ass off for my teammates. And I appreciate that, fellas. Okay? That's what makes great teams. We still, we still have work to do. We got work to do, but I'm telling you, fellas, you earned it tonight. You earned it. You took care of business and you earned it. I'm proud of you guys. Team on three. One, two, three. The Browns is the Browns no more. Cleveland Browns nailing down a playoff berth last night with a 37-20 win over the New York Jets. It looked like it was going to be a barn burner at first. It really settled down into the second quarter and specifically into the second half. But offensive explosion from the Browns. Jets couldn't keep up. Browns now at least the five seed. And Peter, the hidden headline in all this, there's still a path that is not kooky talk. There's a path for the Browns to get the number one overall seed in the AFC. That is remarkable. It's not likely, but it's not zero. There's a chance that the Browns end up being the team who hosts every playoff game they're in this year. And good morning. Welcome back. We missed you last week. Good morning, Mike. Good to be back. And, you know, I think Jerry Dulac of the – you know, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette had a great little tweet which says it all about the Cleveland Browns that this will be the first year since 1989 that the Browns have finished the season with a better record than the Pittsburgh Steelers, which, when you think about it, has to be one of the most insane things I've ever heard. But, you know, think about it. 34 years of Steelers' supremacy over the Browns and the Browns deserve it. Look, I think now we can erase this silly myth of the uh, of the Jets having this incredible defense and this defense for the ages. I mean, they've allowed 31 points and 11 tu- a game and 11 touchdowns over the last three weeks. So let's uh, by that defense, by the way. So we can just kill that that might be the only thing we say about the Jets in these two hours but I do think what was so good about what the Browns did in this game is that it showed the strength and the depth throughout the entire organization it's not just the players it's not just the coaches led by Kevin Stefanski and it's not just the front office led by Andrew Barry it is all of them This team has survived the ridiculous contract given to Deshaun Watson. And, you know, here we are at the end of year two. We're 40% of the way through Deshaun Watson, the Deshaun Watson era of the Cleveland Browns. And still nobody has any idea if he's any good still. You know, so despite all that, despite all the draft choices given up for Deshaun Watson, Andrew Barry has found a way with players like Jerome Ford uh, now that he has found a way to stock this roster so it can play winning football. Kevin Stefanski and that coaching staff, Alex Van Pelt, they have found a way to get four quarterbacks ready to start multiple games in a season where now they look like one of the best teams in football. And obviously the players, and I'm especially impressed with this it it isn't just miles garrett you know and 10 guys anymore if you look at all of the contributors on that defense denzel ward craig newsome these guys are power players in 2023 in the nfl and you know kudos to the organization for really building the kind of team that is young and growing and is going to be good for a long time.
The Browns have fought through various forms and fashions of adversity. They lost a couple of road games not all that long ago at Denver, at the Rams. That was Joe Flacco's first start. We're going to talk about him in a minute. But where they are now at 11-5, and five, I just want to make sure everyone understands the path to the one seed. It starts with the Dolphins beating the Ravens on Sunday, which will be no small feat. The Ravens favored to win the game. The Ravens at home. The Dolphins, yes, finally beat a good team last weekend, but something had to give in the narrative department when the Dolphins and the Cowboys got together. They beat the Ravens. That's a different story altogether. However, if they do beat the Ravens, and then if next weekend the Browns beat the Bengals, the Dolphins lose to the Bills in the AFC East Championship game, which will happen if the Bills beat the Patriots this weekend, and the Ravens lose to the Steelers, the Browns are the one seed in the AFC. Now, that would require the Ravens losing two games at home to both the Dolphins and the Steelers. Unlikely. But the Browns still have a chance to take from the original Browns the number one seed in the AFC. That would be something. I don't, I don't think there's a strong chance, but I wouldn't have thought there was any chance. Until MDS pointed out this morning, oh, by the way, the Browns still have a not crazy shot at being that top seed. And regardless of where they play their games, this team's going to travel in January. They always say defense travels, running game travels. They put a running game together, even though they lost Nick Chubb on the second Monday night of the season in Pittsburgh, lost him for the year. They've put it together with Jerome Ford, with Kareem Hunt, with Pierre Strong. They make it happen. They throw it a lot. They're a little too pass happy. If I had one critique of last night, Peter, once they were comfortably ahead, they were still throwing it and not taking full advantage of the opportunity to just end the game. Run the ball, take the full 40 seconds off the clock, run the ball, reduce the possessions, and get out of dodge. I was afraid for a while they were going to screw around and let the Jets get back into it, but the Jets weren't able to capitalize thanks to the Cleveland defense. That would be my only concern. You got to know when to flip to run out the clock mode. And I think they waited too long to get there last night. I don't. And I'll tell you why. Because to win games that really count, Joe Flacco has got to get comfortable with guys he never heard of before a month ago. So I don't mind it at all. I saw what they were doing. We all saw it. And they kept throwing the ball and they probably could have ground one out. Although the Jets run defense is good. I guess my point is, Mike, I would rather see him throwing to guys like, uh, you know, Harrison Bryan and, and, and David Bell and, and, and all of the guys deep on the bench of the Cleveland Browns because he is going to need them down the stretch and through January as long as they are still active because Flacco's the guy. Um, I think a couple of things I would just say about Flacco that really, really interest me. Um, and it's been said by a lot of people now. You know, what in the world are team after team? I talked to his agent, Joe Linta, a week or so ago. And I was asking him about it. And he goes, week after week, we would just... He said, I was calling teams. Don't you want to at least bring them in for a workout? And, you know, to me, there's something about the Joe Flacco story... When you hear teams or when you hear GMs saying, hey, look, we're looking under every rock for a player. Joe Flacco is, is you know, with his five kids, you know, doing being the carpool dad and looking over every rock, he is throwing himself at teams and saying, sign me, sign me, sign me. And now, look, he becomes the first player. The Cleveland Browns have been playing football since 1946. And you right now are looking at the man who's the first quarterback in the august history of the Cleveland Browns to throw for more than 300 yards four games in a row. And here's a guy who could have been had for nothing. And I'll tell you one other thing about Flacco. When he was negotiating with the Browns a couple of weeks ago, Mike, and remember for like a whatever, 24, 48 hour period, he had to be re-signed to the practice squad because they were doing some roster gymnastics and trying to figure out how to get him on the active roster. So there was like a day or two. So 
it, Linda asked Flacco, you know, do you want to, you, you want me to talk to these other teams, you know, who are still interested now that you've had your little mini ascension? And he said, no. He said, I love it with the Browns. I love Stefanski. I love this offense. Uh, I definitely want to stay here. And and of course, it would have been ridiculous for him to go elsewhere <clears throat> because even if he went to whatever team it would be, Mike, he'd have to get to know a brand new offense and who knows if he's going to be able to keep the number one job. In Cleveland, he knew he was going to the playoffs most likely and he had the number one job and he had a supporting cast that he absolutely knew he could win with. And the final thing he knew, he had a top offensive line. And I still think that that is the number one thing that is so underrated about the NFL right now. If you can protect your quarterback, you've got a chance to win. Because there's a lot of teams. And let's start with Andy Reid's team. <laughs> there's a lot of teams that right now can't protect their quarterback well enough to go on at least what I think would be a deep playoff run. It had to be unprecedented that a team's starting quarterback was not on the 53-man roster because he had been practice squad, called up, practice squad, called up, reverts to the practice squad, had to be signed to the 53-man roster, and was available to any other team. As you said, why would he go anywhere else after – the Browns were the only team that gave him an opportunity. He told me after his first win as the Browns quarterback, he was just about to give up. He thought the phone wasn't going to ring and he was going to move on with his life. At the moment, the phone rang and the Browns gave him that chance. They worked him out on a Friday, signed him to the practice squad on a Monday, and the rest is history, and history keeps getting better and better for Joe Flacco to the point where when you weren't hearing Browns fans banging trash can lids last night which was non-stop to the point that it was irritating Al Michaels you were hearing Joe Flacco's name being chanted by the faithful in Cleveland here's Flacco after the game talking about the fact that they were chanting Flacco 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 last night in Cleveland yeah I heard him a little bit yeah what did you think? yeah it's it's cool I mean just put yourself in that position I mean you can't deny it it, it, it was it's it, it's you know it, it, I said it from the very beginning. I mean, the city's been unbelievable. Um, our my teammates have been unbelievable, like in in terms of just embracing me onto this football team. So uh, it's all been great, and it, it makes it that much more special to you know be able to come in here and, and play some good football. As you mentioned, Peter, four straight games with 300 or more passing yards. Flacco round and find out. I like that twist on one of our favorite sayings a permissible to say on the show twist on one of our favorite sayings and he's getting it done first quarterback to throw for 300 or more yards against the Jets defense since Tom Brady in 2021 extending plays the play where Quinnen Williams clubbed him in the head and maybe it wasn't sufficiently forcible yeah. to draw a Got roughing no the passer ball. foul yeah. didn't matter because he still keeps it alive finds Jerome Ford who then slices and dices and works his way through the defense and ultimately scores a touchdown. That was the moment. Because at that point, it was 27-14. The Jets had had the, the pick six on that great play by Jermaine Johnson. And you're thinking, maybe something's going on here for the Jets. Maybe something could happen. Once this went down, that was it for the Browns against the Jets. This was the magical play of the night. And that's one of the big reasons they were chanting his name at the end of the game. And well, they should. And the weirdness of it, you know, here he, look, Joe Flacco for, you know, a decade uh, basically tried to drive a stake through the heart of the Browns every time he played him, played him twice a year. He was on the hated Ravens. It's just one of the weirdest things. It's like, you know, it's like when Johnny Damon, I know you don't, you wouldn't appreciate this as much as I would, but it's like when Johnny Damon went from, uh, you know, went between Boston and New York in baseball, or I'm sure you can find examples in hockey and basketball that, you know, it's sometimes things just don't seem right. You know, when players go from one arch rival team to another, and especially in this particular situation, you know, it's almost, 
it's weird to think that Joe Flacco is not only not an insurance policy, but right now, today, at this moment, Joe Flacco holds the key to how far the Browns go in the playoffs. I mean, let's put it, let's say it exactly the way it is. If they're getting ready for a playoff run with Dorian Thompson Robinson or whoever it would be, you know, somebody who hasn't been there before. I mean, let's just remember, Mike, 10 years ago this season, I was uh, walking at maybe 1.30 in the morning to a, uh, to a restaurant in New Orleans that the Joe Flacco family had bought out for the evening for a party for Joe Flacco after he won the Super Bowl. And they didn't know what was going to happen, but they felt pretty good about it. So you walk into this place and it's all Flacco's family, friends, everybody from South Jersey. And this was the year when Joe Flacco gambled on himself. And the next year, what, five months later, three months, two months later, probably, he became the first $20 million quarterback in NFL history. And now it seems like, man, that was 10 years ago. Flacco beats the 49ers in the Superdome in the Super Bowl. And then, you know, weeks later, he is handed the biggest contract in NFL history. And and here we are again. And so to me, it's just one of these really, really fun stories. Tommy DeVito's story was like a sugar high. This story really seems to be able to pass the test and stand the test of time. And I think Flacco is going to make the Browns fairly dangerous in the playoffs because he's a competent quarterback who probably isn't going to lose the game for you. And here's the difference. And this is why Joe Flacco has been so good. You've got the intersection of lingering physical abilities. And on that touchdown pass to Jerome Ford, he moved like, I don't think he's moved since... 2012, the year they won the Super Bowl and he was the MVP. But he's got the experience. He's seen it all. He walks up to the line of scrimmage. He's got the supercomputer from all those reps, all those plays, all those games. The sweet spot, the quarterbacks who play into their mid-30s will arrive at where they can diagnose pre-snap. They don't need the little red Amazon circles to let them know what they need to be looking for. They know how it's going to unfold. They sense how it's going to open. You see how it processes. That's not instinctive. That's not innate. It becomes instinctive. It becomes innate when you do it over and over and over again. And even though he's still getting to know his teammates, he knows how to read defenses. He knows from the moment he comes out of the huddle, surveys what's there, snaps the ball, all that stuff that's going on for a quarterback that he has to process. He's seen it so many times, and he can still deliver the football. He can still buy enough time and buy even more time than we thought he could. That's why, unlike the other backup quarterbacks who have a shelf life because they get figured out, the defenses get enough film. It's like, okay, now we know what this guy is doing, and then boom, the chariot goes back into a pumpkin, whether it's Tommy DeVito, Josh Dobbs, whoever. With Joe Flacco, he's only going to get better. That was something Robert Sala, the Jets coach, said last night. He's getting better each and every week. Yeah, he's getting more comfortable in the offense, And he's sufficiently experienced at reading defenses, understanding who's going to be open, where the weaknesses are, how he can keep a play alive. And they're getting with Flacco what they thought they were going to get with Deshaun Watson. And you mentioned the Watson contract. They still got three years, fully guaranteed. They have to deal with that. I don't know that Flacco sticks around for three more years, but it really is amazing to see where they are and how far they go. And Peter, I've got two Christmas wishes that have yet to come to fruition because it's not yet ripe. But I want Matthew Stafford going back to Detroit in the playoffs, and I want Joe Flacco going back to Baltimore at some point in the playoffs. Hey, you know, Mike, I've thought of that, and I've thought of the 98th uh, Buffalo-Kansas City game in the last three or four years. They would all be really sweet playoff games, but you're absolutely right. Rams at Detroit, uh, Browns at Cleveland, I, I'm sorry, Browns at Baltimore, both of them would be absolute killers. I mean, the NFL right now is looking at a wild card weekend that could be absolutely extraordinary because 
think about normally when you think about you sort of ho-hum your way through the you know the afternoon game on Saturday but then Saturday night Sunday night Monday night there could be three really fantastic potentially matchups ones that the NFL doesn't have to invent uh, a plot line for that they're just sitting there but it would be fantastic and look I have no idea what's going to happen with we don't know what's going to happen with the with the standings the rest of the way but I think there are enough good stories heading into the playoffs I think it'd be great if the Rams made it regardless of who they played because and I know we're going to talk about this later in the show I've really started to think that look it's not impossible not impossible that Matthew Stafford could win the MVP and and I doubt it's going to happen but I think that there are a lot of things for all of these awards that are very very much still in play but I do think the the potential matchups for wild card weekend are going to be fantastic Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.